Welcome to Clear Eyes, Full Hearts, a podcast presentation of Cadence 13. In association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions, this is an episode-by-episode look at the award-winning TV show Friday Night Lights created by Peter Berg. I'm Stacey Orstano. I played Mindy Colette, soon-to-be Riggins. And I'm Derek Phillips, and I played Billy Riggins. The assumption is that you, our listeners, have already watched the show. But if you haven't already, go watch Friday Night Lights, which is currently streaming on Netflix and Peacock TV, because there will be spoilers in our episode. And there's merchandise. That's right, baby. We've got merchandise. We've got a website designed by Eleanor Carez, who is at Eleanor Carez on Instagram. And our website is www.cleareyesfullheartspod.com. Once again, that's Clear Eyes, Full Hearts Pod. And as always, we want to answer your questions. Email us what you want to know. Clearizefullheartspod at gmail.com. Today, you guys, we're here. It's season three. It's season three, episode one. I Knew You When, written by Jason Kadams and directed by Jeffrey Reiner. The NBC synopsis reads, A new school year finds Coach Taylor uncertain about the strength of his team and Tammy faces challenge as the school's new principal. And we've got a lot to discuss in this episode. So let's jump in. the bat. We've got this lone guitar sweeping vast Texas landscape and Slam and Sammy meet on the radio and all I can say is we're back, baby! I agree with you, Stacey. I literally felt like 30 seconds into this first episode in season three, it already feels like a different show. And by different show, I mean it feels like the first season of the show. I don't know what was going on, but tonally season two just feels a little off. It was dark. Yeah, it was dark. Also, if you notice, they put the days of the week up at the start of this episode. We haven't done that since I think season one, episode two, maybe Mm -hmm. episode three. That ended, but I think it's kind of a throwback that the writers show, Kadem's chose to let the audience know that this is a new beginning, but we're rewriting the ship. Also, I know we've talked about it before. We had this writer's strike that happened in season two. The show basically at that point was done. I mean, we were off the air. We thought we were never coming back. And there was a deal that had been worked out. We've talked about this before. A deal got worked out where DirecTV would take over half the cost of production on the show. With that deal, DirecTV, the 101 channel, would have the right to air the show first. And then NBC would air it after that. But if it weren't for that deal, show's done. Also, if it weren't for the fans sending NBC light bulbs, save the lights. 100%. You guys, I'm sure a lot of you guys who listen to this podcast were actually a part of this. We had fans of the show actually sending light bulbs into the executives, putting them in packages. And so these poor executives were having to get like packages with just broken light bulbs in it. I think the campaign was called Save the Lights. Save the Lights. But yeah, I mean, if it weren't for you guys, this show would not have been around. But this Mm -hmm. deal winds up getting worked out. I mean, at this point, I'm in L.A., I'm starting to look for other work because I don't think anything's going to happen. And I get a phone call from Kyle Chandler randomly out of the blue. And he's like, we're back, baby. And I'm like, what? And he's like, they salvaged it. We're coming back. We got a third, a fourth and a fifth season. I'm like, what? What? I mean, because at this point, you got to understand, guys, we were living like episode to episode, week to week. We didn't know if we were going to ever finish a season. And then all of a sudden to find out that we're coming back for seasons three, four and five. And it's guaranteed was like, you got to be kidding me. That's just so lucky. And another thing that happened for me in this moment is like, so Stacey and I both were recurring guest stars on this show. And what would happen is they would literally call me on like a Tuesday and be like, so we need you on Thursday. I was never on contract for the show. And then this season, all of a sudden I get a phone call. I had booked a gig on a show called Saving Grace, a little recurring role on Saving Grace. And they called me and it was a Tuesday afternoon. They call my manager, Nan Bernstein did. And she said, we need Derek on a Thursday. My manager goes, Derek's working on another show. And according to my manager, there was silence on the other end. And Nan, who you guys have listened to already, Mm -hmm. she was on the show. She was our unit production manager in charge of keeping the show basically afloat financially. Says to my manager, I'll get back to you in a second. (sighs) At this point, I hadn't been on contract for the show. So they call back my manager and they say, okay, here's the deal. We're going to put Derek on contract, 11 out of 13 episodes. He's not going to be able to do Saving Grace, but we still need him on Thursday. My manager's like, great, I'll call him. I had a roommate at the time. I had two roommates at the time, actually. And so it's Tuesday afternoon. 
And my manager calls me and she goes, okay, so they put you on contract, blah, 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 blah. Here's all the details of it, but they still need you Thursday. And I'm like, oh, so I need to get in the car and start driving. it." She's like, baby, you shouldn't drive. And I'm like, I'm not going to not drive. Like I need to have a car if I'm going to be down there for the next four and a half months. And she's like, well, you still need to shoot Thursday. If you do it straight through, it's about an 18 hour drive, but I don't Mm -hmm. recommend doing it straight through. So I literally hopped in the car. I remember I had a horrible hemorrhoid at the time, which is not part of the story. It was awful terrible hemorrhoid and I had to drive 20 hours with a hemorrhoid. It was awful. So anyway, 20 hour drive down to Austin, Texas. I literally got in there running on fumes to get to work and shoot, but I had my car and I was on contract and I was just excited to be there because I was finally not a series regular, but a contract player on the show. I was guaranteed 11 out of 13 episodes. And I felt like I kind of made it at that point in time. You made it with your hemorrhoid. I made it with my hemorrhoid. I was in a lot of pain. Jesus. (laughs) A lot of pain. (laughs) I'm glad you did have your car because I had moved to New York and I was doing theater. So Kyle called you. I got a call from Adrian Palicki and she goes, we got picked up for season three. And I was like, wait, shut up. No way. And then she goes, and I was like, wait, are you getting married? And she goes, no, but you are. And I was like, to who? And she goes, just wait. And I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> but I'm glad that you had your car there because I did and I was coming from New York. So we used your Mustang to drive around everywhere. I had gotten rid of the Mustang at that point. If you remember, I got that. Was that when you were fancy? That's when I got fancy. I got fancy in th- season three. I got a BMW. You guys, everything changes for Derek and I from here on out. We're rolling in dough. <laughs> I don't we're know We're driving about that, fancy but... car. No, I lived in a tiny apartment in Harlem. <laughs> it was convenient though, having a car now, because most of the time that I'd come down in the first two seasons, I didn't have a car. So I was always relying on Taylor to drive me around. Taylor had this beat up old Ford Focus. I think we've talked about it on the show that we would just destroy driving around Austin, Texas. Anyway, we need to get back onto the show. I've yapped enough about my own personal stuff. So yeah, the show is back and it's already feeling more like season one. Yes, it was nostalgic. It was, I felt like I was home. Everything's feeling good. And then they just start throwing stuff at us. I felt like I as a viewer was a wall and the info was spaghetti and they were throwing it at me. So first of all, (laughs) Principal Taylor, they just throw that out. Uh That happened. Yeah. I mean, a lot has changed in Dylan. Roughly nine months have gone by since the last time we saw these characters in the world of Dylan. In the real world, I think like a year and a half had gone by. But we also find out that Dylan did not win state, that Smash had a potential career ending injury Mm -hmm. in the playoffs after coming back from his suspension, and that there's a new quarterback transfer from Dallas in town, a freshman phenom named J.D. McCoy. All that happens in like the first 25 seconds of the show. Yeah. And there's more to come. Oh, and there's the Riggins Brothers montage. I can't with this montage. It made me laugh so hard. It was literally one of my favorite moments to shoot on this show. And it really kind of defines how Friday Night Lights was shot in so many different ways. And I'm not kidding when I say that that whole montage took literally two minutes flat to shoot. Executive producer and director Jeffrey Reiner just started yelling at Taylor and I. Mm -hmm. He's like, arm wrestle, arm wrestle. So we start arm wrestling. They got cameras on us. And we're arm wrestling and arm wrestling. And I'm really arm wrestling. I have beaten Taylor a couple of times arm wrestling. FYI, for those of you out there just keeping score. I'm going to ask Kitch about that. You can ask Kitch anytime you want to. He knows the truth. He's got pretty boy muscles. I've got functional muscle. <gasps> oh, dear. those are fighting <laughs> words, listeners. I'm going to get back to you about that. Go on, Derek. So Reiner's like arm wrestle, arm wrestle. And he's like, all right, uh, uh, run to the living room. So we run to the living room. They hand us some beers. We start drinking beer. Kitch and I take our shirts off. Kitch is now throwing like an empty beer on me and just like spraying me with beer. And giggling. And I'm screaming, doing my best Taylor Kitch impersonation where he's like, mm-hmm. and Kitch is like throwing at this point, it's beer water fake Mm -hmm. beers. And then they're like, all right, uh, uh, Taylor, go over in the corner like you're puking. And I mean, this is all happening, guys. Two minutes. I grab a bag of cheese puffs. I put them on my chest and pretend like I'm passed out and literally kitches over in the corner puking. We did all that in two minutes. Reiner cuts it all together and then also pulls a clip from season two where Kitch is on the floaty. Yeah, in the pool. And that's basically that little montage. That little montage at the same time that Coach Taylor is saying he's completely devoted to football and ready and he's been working hard all summer. And mm, no, that's not true. I remember being at Taylor's apartment in Austin and watching that scene for the first time and both of us just cackling like little kids watching it. It's so funny. At the time, we didn't know what the 
heck was going on? And then to see it all pieced together with the music and coaches like straight face. You know, Reiner had exactly that in his mind the whole exactly. time. He's so good at that. But it was such a Friday Night Lights moment too. On any other show, we would have shot that for like a day. Yeah. And we shot that, in, I'm not kidding guys, two minutes. So as we said before, there's a lot of stuff being thrown at us in this episode. Thrown at us right next. Tyra and Landry have broken up. But I don't think we learn why, but they're still friends. Yeah, I don't think we know why at this point in time, but we do know that they are broken up. He says break. Yes, they're on a break. Yeah. And Tyra's like, no, we broke up. But all this exposition comes at you in less than five minutes, but it's a beautiful mm -hmm. little cold open to season three. We have the table set for a bunch of new interesting stories. I mean, how's Tammy going to handle the responsibility of being a principal? Does Riggins have what it takes to replace Smash at tailback? What's going to happen to Smash if he doesn't have football in his life anymore? What's going to happen with the Dylan Panthers without Smash if Landry and Tyra are broken up? What does that mean for the two of them moving forward? What's Coach going to do with this new quarterback controversy? Will Matt Saracen be able to deal with this new quarterback controversy? Will he be able to handle it and, and hold on to his starting job? And all of this is done through slamming Sammy Mead mm -hmm. and through the use of these reporters. In the theater, we would call this like a Greek chorus kind of moment. Mm -hmm. It's when the characters kind of break the fourth wall. And breaking the fourth wall is when an actor actually talks directly to the audience. But in Greek theater, the Greek chorus was used to provide a background or to provide exposition and also ask moral questions of the audience and even instill fear and suspense in that audience. So Jason Kadams and the writers on Friday Night Lights are using this age-old theatrical convention to ramp up the tension and tell the audience exactly what is going on at the start of season three. It's really, a, in my opinion, a, a brilliant tool. And the writers on this show use it extremely effectively. You just get a mountain of information thrown at you in a very interesting way, and you never feel like you're being talked at. And I would have to say that's just a damn good use of exposition. I agree. But D, yes. I do have a question for you, though. Yes. Are you ready for Friday night? That is a stupid question, Stacey. I'm always ready for Friday night. Meanwhile, here's another thing that happens in this episode. All this is oh, in like God. six minutes. Riggins is hooking up with Lila again. In Buddy's house. Yes. Like, is Lila still going to that church? What happened to the cute Matt's character? What? Uh, I have questions. And the questions that will never get answered. No, they're never going to get answered because it's almost like season two in some respects. I don't want to say it didn't happen because there are some references in the show to season two. By and mm. large, they kind of just move on from almost all of it. We never talk about the Especially, murder. Especially, thank God, volleyball. No volleyball, no murder, no Santiago. Yeah, gone. And then we are introduced to J.D. McCoy's father, D.W. Moffat. And I just want to know, I'm going to give you some trivia, Derek. Yes. D.W. Moffat was in the original New York production of Larry Kramer's The Normal Heart about the AIDS crisis. I did not know that. He's a big time theater guy. Right after that, he went to do the first Broadway production of Bob and Gilead with a little known actor named John Malkovich. That guy's been treading the boards for a very long time. I had no clue that D.W. Moffat was original cast of Normal Heart. Mm -hmm. HBO did a film mm -hmm. version of it. Taylor Kitsch was also in Normal Heart. <gasps> look at that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wonder. If the, I don't think they played the same character. I don't think so. Just look it up, though. But I don't know. I'd be interested to see what character D.W. Moffat played. He's a really, really talented actor. And he so good. does a really good job at playing Joe McCoy, who yeah. we're going to learn a little bit more about later in this episode. Yeah. And D.W. is just not that guy. D.W. is just like kind of fun. Yeah. He's a fun dude. I didn't get to have any scenes with him, but I really got to enjoy knowing him as a person in this season and in later seasons as well. Oh, dear Lord, I had forgotten. I think I had purposefully packed it away in that part of my brain that I shut down. I had forgotten about the Jumbotron. <laughs> I love the Jumbotron story because it is just so Buddy Garrity. Buddy's up to his old tricks again. I mean, who needs a school or books or teachers or mm -mm. supplies when you mm -mm. got a Jumbotron? Especially with his name on it, like Garrity Motors on it. I want to know how many zeros were on that check, though. I can't figure out if it was 10000 or 100000 We'll never know. I'm thinking it's got to be 100000 That's so much money. Also, stuff that is getting thrown at the audience, it never hit me when we were doing it because I was just in the middle of it, but also getting thrown at the audience with no explanation. You and I are boyfriend and girlfriend now. Yeah, I love it. I said before on this show that it's one of my favorite things about Friday Night Lights and one of my favorite things that Friday Night Lights does is they don't insult the audience with unnecessary exposition. We just jump right in. The writers are like, well, the audience is smart enough. They'll catch up. We don't yeah. need to say, so Billy, uh, I hear you've been dating Mindy. Like, we don't mm -hmm. have to do that crap. All it takes 
is me saying, I got the love of a good woman and I point to you and the audience, I'm sure is sitting there going, what? What? When did that Mindy? happen? Yeah. In a schoolgirl outfit. And then, <laughs> listen, she went to bed to Jesus and woke up with you, the incomparable Billy Riggins. Yeah, that is a great line that Jason Kadams wrote in describing what's going on with Lila and Tim at this point in time. Lila and Tim have this wonderful relationship behind closed doors, but she doesn't want to be in public with him. She doesn't want anyone to know about the fact that she's been hooking up with Tim. We're going to learn a little bit later in this episode why that is exactly. But yeah, just a great line from Jason Kadams. You know, this quote actually ended up in Entertainment Weekly as a favorite quote from TV or film for that month. But here's what I remember about shooting this scene. I love Billy starting the scene with his back to Tim, with his fingers like underneath his nose, like he's some kind of all-knowing sage. I've always mm -hmm. loved playing the opposites in any scene, especially when the scene's kind of comedic, because Billy is... Immoral. Yeah. But in his mind, he's like the Dalai Lama or Confucius or Buddha or all of them combined rolled uh -huh. into one. But I love that Billy's kind of sitting there deep in thought, listening to Tim, like he's absorbing all the information. And of mm -hmm. course, he's going to come back with some ridiculously brilliant response. And what we get is your rebound from Jesus. You know, mm -hmm. which actually is kind of smart. <laughs> but listen, also now, because you're in such a committed, good relationship, yes. of course you can espouse relationship advice. Of course. Billy knows all because he's in this amazing relationship with Mindy, who's literally giving a guy a lap dance right as we have this in conversation. in front of you and your brother. <laughs> right in front of it. And did you improv the line, monkey? I can't remember I that. Did I did because did. I don't know if I told you or not, but I wanted a nickname for you. And I okay. think at the moment, that's the one that came out and it sticks for the rest of the seasons. Is it because I'm shorter than you and I have to climb your body to get to you? <laughs> no, but everything else just sounded so lame, like babe yeah. or muffin or whatever. So you were my monkey. I, I love know. that you just like, I love you too, monkey. Just shoots right out. I think it was an in the moment that stayed forever. Here's the second thing that I remember. This is any time that you shoot any kind of like bar scene or strip club scene or wedding scene or restaurant scene, any place that's supposed to be loud. On set, it's actually dead silent. There's no music. People are not talking. There's no clanking of silverware or plates. I mean, sometimes they even have background actors literally dancing with no shoes on, with no music mm -hmm. playing, just to keep the noise to a minimum. So as an actor, it feels very strange to be one foot away from the other actor you're in the scene with and have to be like, you're a rebound from Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like you're yelling your lines at this other actor, trying to keep that volume up, even though in reality, there's nothing you know drowning your voice out because there is no sound. In landing strip, they would have to, there was always a fog machine in the landing strip. I yes. don't know what, like at a strip club, I don't think they do that, but our landing strip, it was a fog machine. So when they would do fog machine, they would do room tones. So they would play pumping music and just would be like, guys, this is your energy level. Actors, this is what you're talking over. And then when it would roll down and then it was silence. And then you're like, you still have to give it up here. <laughs> yeah. I've worked on a lot of sets where what they'll do is they'll have like the first 10 seconds of a song play. Mm -hmm. So it'd be like, doom, doom, tick -a -doom, doom, tick -a -doom, doom. and then they cut the music so that you at least have that rhythm. And then all the actors are in the background dancing kind of to that rhythm or trying to Listen, keep that Listen, I was same given rhythm. a lap dance to silence. Yeah. <laughs> I did that show looking and there was huh? a long, long, long scene where all of us are supposed to be dancing in the background and everybody's got to be on the same beat. I mean, it was like a three minute long scene and they gave us earpieces. Oh, wow. Little teeny earpieces, a crappy earpiece, but you would hear like a. <laughs> so you at least had some kind of beat to dance to. Have you seen the silent discos? No. It's like a dance you go to, but everybody gets a set of headsets. So you're all listening to the same music and dancing. But if you need a break, you take your headphones off and you can actually talk to a person or have a moment of silence, put your headphones back on, and then everybody dances. I think it's actually kind of cool. That's exactly how I would want to do it, as long as I didn't have to dance mm -hmm. or socialize. So basically, I'd want to just go home to my place. You just want to hang out with headphones on? That's what we're doing literally right That's now. What we're doing right now. 
But yes, yeah, so I mean, that's kind of how it works when you're shooting these scenes, wedding scenes, all that stuff. Actually, at our wedding, we'll get there, but there's so much dancing at our wedding and you and I were dancing with a bunch of the background actors. And I remember one time, one of the background actors said to me, wait, how come me and Derek aren't dancing right now? And I was like, oh my God, you guys are so sweet and dedicated. The camera is not on us right now. It's on Minka. And I was like, you guys actually don't have to right now. But I loved the dedication that anytime they said action, they were working. And you and I are standing there like looking at ourselves. A lot of it is about preserving energy, especially that day. That was one of the longest days we ever had on Friday Night Lights for two reasons. Number one, I think we shot 17 pages in the wedding scene. In one day. In one day, which is unheard of. I mean, usually on a really, really good day where you do about 14 hours, you'll maybe get six to eight pages. That's even still a lot. Yeah. But I mean, we got 17, which is, guys, it's just unheard of. And we did it all in one location. So a lot of it is about preserving energy. I had to learn that kind of the hard way. You get to set, you're excited, you're dancing, you're doing all this. And then by the time hour 10 rolls around, you can barely get out of your chair. And we had been doing it for like three years by then. So I was like, yeah, the cameras aren't on us. We're fine. Okay, moving on. So they're still friends, Landry and Tyra. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like animosity in the breakup, which makes me want to know more about why they broke up. But there's Landry sitting in our backyard and just surrounded by all of the collet undergarments. And it reminded me of the lightheartedness of season one. And I didn't realize how much I missed it. I just feel like there was a cloud hanging over season two in a lot of respects. And in this season, we brought humor back. I think the thing that maybe makes Friday Night Lights work the best, not to say that there wasn't humor in the second season, but it was sparse. And maybe the humor that we need is from people like Landry, because Landry was kind of the guy in the first season who brought a little levity. It felt good, but still, guys, why did they break up? Hearing (laughs) all of the teachers tell now Principal Tammy about the budget cuts and they've lost teachers and about how they actually pay for their own supplies. And this was, what, 13 years ago that we shot Mm -hmm. this? It's not only still prevalent now, it's worse now. I have so many friends who are teachers in the public school system who set up these Amazon wish lists and put them on like Twitter and hope that one goes viral and they can buy supplies for their kids in the classrooms. And teachers teaching with textbooks from like 15 years ago, where stuff has changed. Like the stuff in there doesn't count anymore, but they don't have any money to fix it. It is a messed up system. Let's get political. From the beginning of Friday Night Lights, I mean, the book specifically was political. The book was primarily about this problem right here. I mean, Buzz Bissinger originally went down to Odessa Permian to, to write a story about a high school football team, but he wound up talking about a town's obsession with a sport. It was literally destroying the town. I mean, they stopped caring about whether or not these kids were getting educated. The amount of money that they were spending on the football stadium and on the football players and on the facilities and the practice field, like all this stuff, it was out of control. That's what the book was about. I think people confuse it sometimes and think, oh, it's about football. Mm-hmm. It's not yeah. about football. It's about a town's obsession with a sport that was literally destroying the town and the lives of the students in that town. It's a condemnation on how misguided this town had become. And it's one of the main reasons I think that on the TV show Friday Night Lights, Jeffrey Reiner and W.G. Snuffy Walden, our music supervisor, chose the song Devil Town as a recurring theme because that is representative of what Dillon, Texas is. Coach and Tammy are in a constant battle in Dillon for the well-being of these kids. And it's basically them against this town that seems to only care about wins and losses on the football field. Friday Night Lights has always had that from the book to the movie to the TV show. There's always been that undercurrent of something is not right in this town when we're putting this kind of focus on a game. Yeah, it makes my heart so heavy that it's worse now than it was back then. On a lighter note, I'm not very good with technology, but I'm desperately trying to figure out a way to make Coach Taylor yelling the word smoothie my new ringtone because I think he (laughs) says the word smoothie 13 times. And you know, when you say a word enough times, it starts to sound weird. It started to sound weird and I love (laughs) it. You know what I love about this scene, I've sung his praises a lot on this show, is Mac McGill. He's such a doofus. But Blue Decker just cracks me up in this role. Jeffrey Reiner and I used to constantly have this discussion, and Jeffrey told me that in Dillon, Texas, the only person dumber than Billy Riggins is Mac McGill. Second place. Yeah. You can deal with that. I wonder where Mindy is. Mindy's smart. Mindy's smarter than Billy. She's a little lazy, but she's smart. Yeah. Joe McCoy, though, buying all these smoothies for the team. We don't even know this guy yet, but I already know that this dude is super shady because of that move. And super rich. Yes. 
But yeah, if I was one of those kids on the field, I'd be like, but I just, what, like, do they have protein? I really want a smoothie right now. We also find out later in this episode that Joe McCoy, it's not like his business transferred him down to Dillon, Texas. Oh, he's from Dallas. He's from Dallas and the whole family uprooted and moved to Dillon strictly so that J.D. McCoy could be coached by Coach Taylor. And his theory behind it is, look, if you could take an average quarterback like Matt Saracen and turn him into what you've done, mm-hmm. Imagine what you can do with my son who's already got all these God-given gifts. That's pretty shady. It's kind of messed up. Goes back to what we were talking about, about putting football above everything else. He did also mention if you could take this five foot nine Matt Saracen, but then I was like, but J.D. McCoy is a freshman and he's much smaller than that. So I think you need to slow your roll and let that boy grow up a little bit, but that's just me being me. Here's something else I want to talk about, Stacey. Mm -hmm. This is another thing that reminds me of season one. We get back to these Taylor family arguments that aren't the end all be all. It's not whether or not coach is going to come back and live with the family anymore. It's just a simple family argument about Julie's schedule and coach signing this paper. This scene cracks me up and I love it. I love any time that the Taylors have a little argument, but Kyle does such a wonderful job of playing the deer in the headlights in this scene. And I always love these moments where coach thinks he's doing all the things right. Like he's done Mm -hmm. all the right things. And he thinks that his reward at the end of this is probably going to be that he's going to get laid and it backfires on him. He's playing checkers and Julie and Tammy are playing chess and Julie's eye roll at the end of this scene is just perfect. It makes me smile. It makes me laugh. She crushes it. She's such a little punk teenager, and she's so good at it. And Gracie Bell grew up a little bit, and she's so, so cute. Tyra says to Tammy, I'm going to become my sister and then my mama. I love that this line was written into the show because when we first started, when Dana first came on as my mom, she and I had a little like dinner, just the two of us. And we talked about who we were on this show and our main goal and main purpose of being there was to show Tyra what she didn't want to become. And then that's exactly what Kadams wrote into the show. And I was like, oh, thank God we're doing what we're supposed to do and that Kadams is seeing that. So then I think it's sort of also up the stakes for me and Dana to be even more ridiculous, which we are. Mm-hmm. I loved playing with her so much. I did too. And this was my first time really to get to work with Dana. And I had just so much fun in this season with her and the, the seasons after. It's really something fascinating and fun about working on a TV show for an extended period of time, and it's something that I just really enjoy so much, is that the writers start to kind of write for you. They're like, okay, ooh, Derek could crush this, or Derek would be really good at this, or I've noticed that Derek is kind of like this, and I think this will work for him. I feel like those kind of things are starting to happen for you in this season. They're starting to happen for me in this season. Well, they saw you and I just busting chops and being friends Yeah. anyway, like, and that's how they put the two of us together. I also had completely forgotten that we were only dating five weeks yeah. before you humbled yourselves at the Seven Senoritas. But going back to what we were talking about, I love how committed you and Dana are to all the foolishness that these characters provide. I you guys just jump headfirst in without even checking the water. And not to toot my own horn, I mean, I think the three of us do a really great job of being lovable idiots. Lovable, drunken idiots. Yeah. And then Tyra, there's just the complete 180 with her face. Like she tries to smile and smirk at us, but it's like, oh, oh God. And so much wonderful editing in this episode too, because there's like that line where Dana says something to Tyra along the lines of, oh baby, don't turn that frown upside down. There may be a man for you here in, in, Dylan. in this bar too, or something like that. And it cuts right over to me on the dance floor, grabbing your ass. And making out with you like in a, not in like a romantic way, but like a gross, drunk, tongue touching your tonsils kind of thing. Which Stacey and I have had this conversation ad nauseum, but you guys don't understand. These scenes can be nightmarish when you're on a film or television set, having to do kissing scenes or make out scenes or any kind of physical stuff, because you're always worried about, at least for me as a guy, I'm always worried about like, I think the scene kind of calls for this, but I don't want to look like a pervert. But I think Billy probably is a handsy guy. Like Billy probably wants to grab boobs and grab butts Mm -hmm. and and all that. And from day one, when Stacy and I found out that we were in a relationship, Stacy goes, come here. And I go, what? She goes, grab my boobs. And I go, what? She goes, grab my boobs. And I go, okay. So I grab, she said, grab my butt. I'm like, I grab her butt. And she goes, anytime you feel like doing this on set or anytime you want to kiss me, 
You can do it. Yeah. You don't have to ask permission. So from that point on, guys, it was completely and totally comfortable. And I'm so thankful that Stacy did that because I think that's what makes these characters feel lived in. And uh, guys, I would not say that to anybody. But with you, I was like, don't ask permission. Whatever you think Billy would do, go for it. Because Mindy yeah. would do the same thing. Yeah. And I think that these two are, they're the king and queen of PDA, probably. So much dancing. This season, so much dancing for Billy and so Mindy. So much dancing. So much dancing and so much kissing. I feel like I touched Stacy's butt more than I touched my own this season. I can tell you this much. I definitely kissed you more this mm-hmm. season than I kissed anybody else. And I mean, in my real life. No, no, definitely. Because <laughs> yes. you have to do it like 20 times too. But thank you, Stacy. I know I've told you that before in private, yes. but thank you so much for being awesome as a scene partner. So another thing exciting about this scene for me is that half the guys on the dance floor and half the guys in the band were all FNL crew members. We got grips, gaffers, people in props in there. Specifically, John Schaefer is in there who played Billy's buddy Falcon, and he was also part of the props department. The song at the very end after I proposed to you, the band immediately goes into John Parker, John Parker. I don't know the words, but that was a reference to our set dresser, John Parker, and Jeffrey Reiner made them play that. So it's all kind of an inside thing with crew and cast of Friday Night Lights. But it's kind of a theme, I think, in film and television, whenever you need manly looking men to fill out a scene or you need some 'er ne'er-do-wells in a scene, Mm -hmm. just turn the camera around and point it at your crew. And a lot of them were musicians, too. Yeah, well, it's Austin. Everyone's a musician. It's like LA. Everyone's got a screenplay. Everyone in Austin's a musician. That's true. Okay, if anybody gets to go to college, I need it to be Tyra. She deserves it, I think, more than anyone. That vice principal, I just can't fathom looking at somebody who's trying so hard, a teenager, and telling them, no, you can't do that. Instead of, you know what? You should try. Yeah. She needs it. I had a guidance counselor in high school that was kind of the same way. Like I went in there, they didn't know me and they look at my grades and they go, yeah, I don't think you're really college material. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Meanwhile, I applied to like 16 schools because I was scared to death that I wasn't going to get into college because of this guy. And I wound up getting into like 13 of those 16 schools. That's so messed up. That's like not your job. This guy was like trying to push me into junior college. Not that there's anything wrong with junior college, but like. No, but to tell you, you can't. Yeah. I don't know what this guy's deal was. That makes me mad. I don't like it. Okay. Derek and I had a tiny little disagreement. It wasn't a disagreement. Oh, it was a fight, Stacey. It was a fight. You guys, we almost quit the podcast this morning. (laughs) I'm just kidding. We didn't. I was saying that we didn't see J.D. McCoy's face until the very end. And he says, you see it at the beginning. I missed it. That's not how I said it. I said, what are you, an idiot? Are you a moron, Stacey? What are you? What is even wrong with you? He pulls off his mask after he does his big pass. His helmet. What did I say? Mask. Oh my God, helmet. I was still so (laughs) mad at you from before. (laughs) Oh, Jesus. And I wonder if anybody screamed like when it came out the way that I did when I first met Jeremy Sumter. Oh my God, you're Peter Pan! Because I loved that movie and it's Jeremy Sumter. And Derek, I did a little Google research and I looked Jeremy Sumter up. He is a 33-year-old, incredibly handsome man now. Is he 33? 33. And very grown up and handsome. I felt so old because to me, he was such a young in here. He was so young. That makes me feel really old because he was he was 18, I think, when we were doing and, but this. But so baby faced. But yeah, he was baby faced. And he was, yeah, I mean, very childlike at that point. You know, he's still a kid. He's yeah, still a kid. Played Peter Pan. But he always had like this grin ear to ear, mm-hmm. always smiling, always happy, mischievous a little bit. A little bit, yeah. I remember he was always like kicking footballs or throwing footballs and Nan Bernstein would have to be like, Jeremy, please, there's camera equipment here. Oh no. (laughs) And you guys, when a new football player comes onto the team, I'm not going to lie, the guys that have been around for a while will do a little bit of friendly hazing, but I think we'll keep those stories to ourselves. Jeremy had to earn his place. And and just FYI, that wasn't just Jeremy throwing footballs. I mean, that was pretty much all of us. I got busted a lot of times by Nan. Nan would come on and guys, stop. Mm -hmm. We've got hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment here. Please stop throwing the footballs. And I'm like, Nan, got a great arm. Don't worry yeah, about maybe, it. Yeah, maybe, Nan, maybe you haven't seen my accuracy. Check it out. It's like corralling kittens. God bless. And then, oh, okay. So I think we've learned the 
Principal Tammy is not going to play by the Dylan rules. I think the Dylan rules are Panthers first, Panthers before anything. Yes. She is full on going to reallocate the buddy money, the buddy bucks. I love that she goes into coach's office at one point and she's like, are those new computers? Why is it so cold in here? He's like, I like to keep it at 68 68. degrees. And she's like, hmm. I mean, the actual school doesn't have computers. Or I see. The AC's out, but like the coach's offices are pristine. They've got brand new in-network computers so they can communicate with each other from their desks. I was mad for her. <laughs> I care about education like a lot. But you could literally see the steam coming out of her ears as she left coach's office. So I assume that's going to be a point of contention for her and coach moving forward. I assume so. Again, I know a little bit more going on from the show just because I was there more from here, but I still haven't watched yeah. the show. So I still am going to be like, ooh, Tammy's going to ruffle some Dylan feathers, some Panther feathers. True. I want to know where Billy Riggins was in this greatest Panthers moments video. <laughs> I don't think I could tell you that. I don't know why they didn't have any Billy clips. They definitely had a buddy clip, which was great. They had an old picture of Brad Leland from high school. I don't know if that was his own hair or if he permed it or what. Oh, that was absolutely his hair. It was beautiful. I don't know where Billy was in the Best of Panthers video, but I specifically remember that night for some reason, really, really well. Because in between scenes that we were shooting, I was outside of the dealership having a deep conversation with Palicki about life and about relationships and about our careers. And this was the first season, I think I talked about this earlier, that I was put on contract. So that was like a big moment for me. But I also remember that we were talking about the Olympics. I just happened to remember that for whatever reason, the 2008 Summer Olympics were airing while we were shooting. That's a weird memory to have. It is weird. You ever have those moments that are, yeah. and it's not like anything spectacular happened, but this was like, 15, 16 years ago, but it feels like it was yesterday. And I remember so much about that night and I remember the conversation we were having. I'm going to tell you mine that just happened two days ago and it's not going to be anything to do with this at all. But it was like 12 years ago, we went to see a movie. Derek and I have two friends named Allison Tolman and Emerson Collins. And mm -hmm. we were talking about Netflix and I was like, you guys, I just don't see it as a sustainable model. I don't see how they're not going to lose money. They treated me like I was the stupidest. Pe and they're like, you think streaming's going to go anywhere? What are you talking about, Stacey? And I was like, how are they making money? Cut to now, Netflix is laying off people and charging a lot more money. So listen, I'm just saying, Tolman and Emerson, you won't remember that conversation because it happened in a movie theater 20, <sighs> what, 12 years ago. So there. All right, all right, all right. We'll see how this holds up in posterity. Oh, 10 years from now, we'll see if Netflix is still around. Again, we're not going to get political, but I have quite a few different bets placed on if Elon Musk is actually going to buy Twitter or not. And I'm about <laughs> to become real, real rich, guys. You don't think he's going to do it? I don't. Well, by the time this actually comes out, we might know. You heard it here first. <laughs> All right, back to Friday Night Lights. Coach Taylor not giving up on Smash. I have gotten it, but it just keeps hitting me over the head. I completely understand how Kyle Chandler slash Coach Taylor is one of the most beloved characters in all all of TV history. People say it, but it just, I keep being like, oh no, yeah, that's why I get it. And what's really interesting about this is that Smash's character is very loosely based off of a real person named Booby Miles, who is in the book Friday Night Lights. And Booby Miles had a career ending injury his senior year and lost scholarship offers. And basically his whole entire life after that moment, it, well, it changed. He wound up playing like two years in a junior college, but just was never the same. And basically everyone in the town that used to love Booby Miles kind of walked away from him. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of feel like everyone in the town is kind of walking away from Smash, but Coach Taylor is. Coach Taylor's there and Coach Taylor is going to make sure that even if it's not football, I think Coach is just going to make sure that like Smash gets back on his feet. No pun yeah. intended. Racquetball scares me. I feel like the ball would always fly right at my nose. You should never... Play racquetball. I should definitely never play. You guys, I'm no. very accident prone. I should never play racquetball. Yeah. Again, we end on this perfect shot of Smash. Guys just knows how to have a last moment and I yeah. loved it. And he slams the ball. He smashes the ball. Oh, he does smash the ball. However, because it's me, I really wanted him to smash that ball on the wall. And then you see realization flash over in his face and he yells out, oh, actually, um, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, sir. Actually, you drove me here. Um, I'm stuck. See, that is why you're an actor on the show and not a director on Friday Night Lights. Hey, listen, how does he get home? He uses the Dylan subway. We've already discussed the, the subway system I in Dylan. I think he's got to walk back to the Alamo freeze and work on that ACO. But yeah, right. Coach drives him somewhere and leaves him there, a la, a la Tim Riggins. Okay, guys, I'm going to cut her off right now. She's done. That is the end of our episode for today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, though. And please... 
Join us next week, episode two, entitled Tammy Knows Best. But until then, clear eyes. Full hearts. Can't yeah. lose. Clear Eyes, Full Hearts is a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. Executive producers are Stacey Oristano and Derek Phillips, Chris and Mandy Wimmer for Black Barrel Media, and Steve Walters for Ritual Productions. Our producer is Miranda Parham. Send your questions to cleareyesfullheartspod at gmail.com. Find us on social media. I'm Stacey Oristano on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Derek Phillips on Twitter and underscore Derek Phillips on Instagram. And check out our websites, cleareyesfullheartspod.com, cadence13.com, and blackbarrelmedia.com. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next week.